We know that the coronavirus has, of course, changed many things around the world very dramatically. One of those things is potentially the world of health care, as well as the way that we do business on a day-to-day -day basis. We're going to speak to the head of a company that has health care, fintech, and a wide variety of other interests across China and the wider Asia region as well. I caught up with Jessica Tan, the group co-CEO of Ping An. I asked her what her business, her healthcare business at Ping An, had learned from the coronavirus outbreak. Take a listen. Yes, healthcare is a big, um, compared, uh, healthcare ecosystem is a very big thing for us. Um, we have four key units here from Good Doctor on Online uh, Health uh, to Smart Healthcare in our Smart City. Uh, which looks at basically technology enablement for uh, the offline providers like hospitals and doctors. Uh, we have a third unit, Health Connect, which does social health insurance. Uh, and then uh, we have a fourth unit, which is really our uh, research institute uh, in health tech and bio research. Um, what, what really struck us uh, during this um, very unusual time uh, during COVID is actually uh, how much um, actually potential I think technology can have uh, in improving accessibility, um, efficiency, effectiveness, and affordability for healthcare. Um, and, we, and we feel that this is the right direction that we've been doing. Right? I'll, give, I'll give three examples um, just to make it a little bit more concrete. The first one is in terms of uh, you know, helping cities to have better ability to predict and manage uh, you know, crises like, like as, uh, such as COVID-19. Uh, so if you look at it, uh, how they, you know, it's at the beginning, you know, being able to accurately predict, right, um, you know, what the level of infection um, might be in different districts is very critical. Uh, we were fortunate in our healthcare, um, health tech research institute to help with about, I think, over uh, 30 cities, um, you know, to help them with how to do this. We're about 90 Nine percent accurate a day in advance, uh, ninety-eight um, percent, you know, seven days in advance, uh, which help them to measure better responses, right? So I think that's that's one on delivering of healthcare um, uh, kind of uh, overall provision. I think the second example would be around uh, accessibility to users. And as you know, um, during COVID, a lot of the uh, small illnesses like flus or if your, your child has a fever, etc., people don't really want to go to the hospitals, um, which is something that we've been pushing for years actually uh, with the um, setup of Good Doctor. And we found that I, uh, during the COVID um, situation at the beginning, uh, our basically online consultation increased about nine times. Um, you know, and I think that basically changed a kind of a consumer adoption or behavior, something that might have taken years to do so, um, basically would compress in a few months. Uh, and hopefully that's something that will continue to improve. Our, our belief is that actually about 34% of all the illnesses can be done uh, much more effectively and affordably actually online. Uh, so I think that's one positive thing that we see going forward. And then thirdly is I think actually to the healthcare system itself, right? If you look at the doctors, right, uh, in many of the countries, right, in China, I mean, the, the diagnostics, um, uh, ability to diagnose uh, the, the, the virus itself, actually the clinical path, um, you know, kept updating. Right? It was uh, difficult for any normal doctors to even do so. Um, we have this um, ASPOP clinical decision support system that we provide to about 37, uh, three, uh, 370,000 doctors um, you know, across uh, you know, 10,000 in my medical institution, which help them better diagnose, right? including medical imaging, which is one of the diagnostics methods and stuff. So I think we were encouraged by some of these things to have, I think we could see how technology could help improve the effectiveness uh, and accessibility for the healthcare system, be it around uh, you know, to the government, to the consumers, or even to the professionals themselves. Uh, speaking of technology helping, so I know that Health Connect is working with the Chinese government as part of the new social welfare system. Do you see scope for further cooperation there, given the events of 2020? Yeah, uh, I, I think so. I think longer trends, uh, not just in China, but more broadly, healthcare um, expenditure, rising costs is is a, is a definite trend, right? I think in China, when you look at the aging population, the increasing affluence, et cetera, this is definitely a trend that will continue to happen. We have about one, close to about a one US dollar trillion he uh, healthcare expenditure. Um, now, in terms of affordability, now most of it is provided by the social health insurance in China right now. Um, and private health insurance is a very small percentage, a single uh, percentage digits, right? So if you look at um, folks in critical illness, actually 44% of them uh, of the expenditure is self-paid, 
right? So as the costs increase, um, you know, it's going to outpace actually the average affluence level, uh, and that's going to cause problems on how they can afford that uh, going forward. So we do see lots of room. One of the reasons we created Health Connect, on one hand, is to take our technology to help them manage better uh, in terms of what are the right uh, healthcare costs that you should manage. Uh, so we're, we're, we've been building with the government on the various diagnostics related groups on setting different standards so there's no over treatment and fraud and abuse. Uh, on the other hand, also in the long term, we believe that you know, that's good models whereby public um, social health insurance as well as private health insurance can be combined better, particularly for different segments and chronic disease, which basically constitute the bulk of the cost. Uh, 2020 was such an unusual year in, in many different respects. I'm just wondering if the crisis caused you to reevaluate any of your existing businesses or technology investments. Are there any that you think in light of recent events maybe need to be retooled or reworked or reconsidered? Um, no, actually, I think uh, even as a very digital uh, kind of organization, it's only made us um, stronger that actually we were in the step in the right direction. In fact, we felt we were not fast enough. Um, I think, um, you know, it, it, this crisis actually stretched us uh, very, very much because uh, even in our remote um, work arrangements, typically we plan for maybe 10%, 20% of the people working remote. And we're already one of the better uh, organizations to have that plan. I think uh, during Chinese New Year this time, uh, you know, we were forced within five days to figure out how to get 1.4 million working you know, completely remotely at home. Uh, so, you know, there were enough even servers uh, to, to go around. I think that really stretched us. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it took us about a month to really get everything in place. Uh, but it, it actually forces us to be more aggressive. Uh, if anything, you know, we were, we had to get over a million agents to do their sales meetings in the morning in the branches uh, completely online. Uh, so we were hosting like 17,000 of such, you know, sessions uh, every day. Uh, you know, getting everyone work remotely uh, and even the customers uh, instead of meeting them face to face. We started experimenting whereby, you know, we would do like video chats with them uh, and brought in specialists. So if anything, I think it actually gave us confidence and the you know, persistence that this is something in the right direction that we needed for ourselves as well tech businesses. So we're going to double down and actually accelerate that. So one of the other challenges besides business continuity this year is, of course, the economic slowdown, the potential hit to uh, the business itself. Lloyd's of London has estimated that the COVID crisis could cost the global insurance industry, I think, something like uh, $200 billion. What are you doing to offset that hit to the business? So definitely, um, we, like many other businesses, are uh, hit by uh, the COVID impact. Uh, I think for us... Uh, we were fortunate in the sense that I think as um, as financial services insurers, we were relatively less hit, but, you know, it doesn't take away the fact that, you know, our agents can't meet people face-to-face, -face, so the effectiveness is definitely lowered a bit. Um, our credit uh, businesses, uh, you know, some of them, particularly to SMEs, et cetera, will be impacted by a little bit. Um, and of course, the investment, overall investment background, so we're definitely hit by a little bit. I think one of the things that we... Uh, the way we think about this too, I think one, of course, lessening the impact, um, you know, so uh, we've been taking various measures uh, in terms of risk mitigation and stuff. Uh, so we're quite diversified. So, you know, I think we're relatively quite muted in that sense. Mm -hmm. I think on the other, uh, on the other area, we looked at this also um, areas of opportunities where we can accelerate some of the growth, right? Uh, so I, I mentioned the course about health, uh, about some of tech businesses, for example, um, in our one connect, which is our FinTech, uh, subsidiary, uh, you know, during this period for them, actually, we have dozens of financial institutions reaching out to us proactively because they needed the tools to help them accelerate that better. Um, so I think it is an, also an opportunity for us, I think, to to accelerate. So in the we look at this longer term, um, you know, that uh, you know, will grow together with the industry. Well, Pagan does have so many different businesses. You have really good insight into the overall health of the Chinese consumer, the Chinese economy at the moment. Give us some insight, some color on what you're seeing at the moment. Are things beginning to recover? Yeah, um, so I think China is very fortunate in the sense that um, we started going through the crisis first. Uh, so, you know, experiencing right around, you know, end of January, early Feb. Uh, so uh, actually, is you know, much of the things have already resumed by now. I mean, I just got back from Singapore uh, last month. Um, you know, if I look at how Singapore and Southeast Asia is doing, it's really going through 
the first kind of maybe in the mid second wave um, where a lot of things are in the lockdown and stuff. Uh, but if you look at the rest of China, um, it's resumed quite a lot. Because, um, and I think, uh, so we expect the second half uh, for China to be relatively strong rel uh, relative to the rest um, you know, uh, of the world. Uh, but it's going to be still muted. Um, you know, for, for starters, you can, there's a few signs that you can look at. One is that much of the growth now, um, I think supply-driven growth is a bit stronger than the demand-side-driven growth. I mean, if you look at the main numbers, uh, the industrial output in increase is actually a lot more year-on-year, -year, um, you know, increase. But the retail is still about down by about uh, minus 2.8% year-on-year. Uh, so I think uh, right now you get a little bit more supply than the, um, than the demand. Uh, the second sign you can look at is also from the... Uh, definitely trade is impacted, um, but and then but imports is going to be a little, uh, growth is going to be stronger than the exports side, um, and again, kind of makes sense because um, you know there's not much to export out, but you know uh, China is to continue to grow that side. So I think we looked at this cautious. Uh, it's probably a little bit better. Uh, our own uh, research institute estimate about three percent real GDP growth uh, in China this year. Um, so we continue to watch out um, very cautiously. Mm -hmm. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the situation in Hong Kong, because of course you are a Hong Kong listed company, but you are based over the border in Shenzhen. How are you thinking about the future of the city at the moment? Do you remain committed to Hong Kong? Do you still see it as a sort of gateway into the Chinese market? Yeah, I think Hong Kong has some very unique uh, advantages, uh, you know, historically. It's still a very important financial center and also a very, uh, one of the very important gateways uh, to China, right? I mean, if you look at any of the numbers, be it, let's say, um, you know, offshore and the transactions, or even uh, if you look at the, um, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, the foreign investments, um, you know, uh, onshore, I think about 50% of the RMB bond, overseas RMB bond turnover in China actually comes through Hong Kong. So I think it still remains a very important financial center. And then secondly, I'm encouraged also by the Greater Bay Area Development. Uh, I think it's a very real uh, uh, right direction, you know, instead of cities competing with each other, um, you know, really looking at different cities and their relative strengths right? um, and creating a much more regional bay area type of uh, development. And I, I, I personally believe a lot in that. As of course, lots of ins market infrastructure to make sure that it can really cross through, be it, you know, be it uh, currency or you know, uh, rules and regulations and stuff. But this is something that I think will work in the longer term. Uh, and therefore, we remain committed uh, to Hong Kong. We have businesses in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, as you know, we have one of the virtual banking license. Uh, we have some of our insurance and banking operations there. So we remain committed uh, for the long term. Uh, and hopefully, we'll grow together with the Bay Area. I wanted to ask you about your technology investments as well. Of course, we have seen a lot of tech valuations take a big hit during the market turmoil. How are you thinking about those at the moment? How do you evaluate potential investments? And also, how do you judge their success? I think the, um, my personal view is that the tech investment industry is going to be much more um, uh, diverging. I think you will see some that are real stars because they are very getting more and more scarce value, uh, I think you'll find that if you go with uh, having a sufficient scale, you know, a unique and sustainable and profitable model, uh, you're going to find very few, right? So I think you will see actually, you know, diverging kind of outcomes. Um, our own investments have been uh, quite fortunate. Uh, you know, if you look at, I mean, obviously, Good Doctor has actually increased by like four times this year uh, in market cap. Uh, even One Connect uh, has increased by about 90% since it listed. In New York uh, end of last year. Uh, so I think we remain encouraged that if you work on the right model in the long term, it's going to be, it's going to be um, right. Um, my, my only um, kind of worry is that, um, you know, lots of investors kind of follow the wind in some sense. Um, I think if you look at, uh, you know, it's very different investing in tech businesses than in the mature industries, right? We look at profitability and stuff like that. So it requires pretty savvy uh, investors who understands the under, the business model itself and the economics. And it's not about, you know, how much you lose, et cetera, it's whether it's a sustainable and really address a real need. Uh, and I think this will seep out some of the ones that were more like they have a nice tagline, but you know, they're not really adding much value nor is sustainable. Uh, so I think this will hopefully diverge much more, but there's a lot of uh, very tech savvy institutional investors uh, that, that are holding up actually the right valuations for different types of uh, markets. And so I think it will calibrate after a while. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Well, I wanted to ask you about fintech in particular. If we could zoom in on that at the moment. Uh, the coronavirus crisis clearly tested the digital banking capabilities of a lot of financial firms. Uh, what did you learn from that experience? Did it expose any gaps in Ping An's own fintech? Do you see additional opportunities there, perhaps? Yeah, I think um, a lot of the fintech in the uh, uh, industry have been focused on customer interactions, right, doing servicing and stuff like that. I think this COVID virus stretches us to be a lot more complete and deep uh, in the things. So I think uh, it covers basically three areas. Um, uh, changing the way that it's not about just online sales, but it's online and offline integrated together. So it was really enabling how your sales act agents actually work and not just having a mobile banking app. Um, so I think that would be that one area will accelerate. Um, the second area is actually uh, how our professionals work together. Financial services is a very specialized industry. I mean, if you're risk experts, even you know, different product risk experts, right? And each one of them are very siloed in their own areas. Now, one of the things that technology can do is actually enable, it's not to replace them, uh, but actually to enable that much better, right? So we, we figure out like, um, we've been experimenting that for, for about two years, um, like our sales, uh, our contact center agents, our uh, claims risk adjusters, you know, basically working alongside and not to replace them, but to help them institutionalize that knowledge better, right? In uh, various AI models. So I think that's gonna accelerate because it forces them the whole disaggregation of the value chain, you can get these people much, working much better, right? Uh, because of the model system. And then I think the third area is about thinking whose customers are this, right? It used to be that financial services kind of fight each other on customers. Um, in, in the internet world, that's a very, um, it's a meaningless discussion. A user is a user. It can be yours and can be mine, right? So I think it talks about much more open collaboration um, ecosystem. Now, everyone kind of talks about that, but nobody has really find a sustainable model to do that. And I think um, we were experimenting with something. Uh, for example, one of the uh, One Connect built a blockchain SME platform in Guangzhou province during the COVID virus, um, whereby, you know, instead we, we offered our technology and then worked with the government, um, you know, getting government subsidies as well as 200 over financial institutions on the platform. And then for the SMEs who needed this, uh, created risk models to help disperse, better assess and, you know, uh, disperse the loans amongst all. I was very encouraged in less than five months, um, you know, we have 33,000 SMEs um, and then over, I think, 20 billion yuan of uh, loans, 55% were dispersed. Right? And I think that's a kind of a new model whereby, you know, uh, technology kind of brings financial institutions together instead of competing with each other uh, because each one is slightly different and that it can be shared uh, across uh, with some of the capabilities. Uh, so I think these three areas, are, I think something that uh, through the COVID kind of changed and accelerated uh, some of the changes. All right. Well, Jessica, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you so much for being with us today. That's Jessica Tan, the group co-CEO of Ping An. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tracy.